On today's episode of The Rock Therapy Show, we're talking about the power of music, yoga, and hypnotherapy coming right up. Hi, welcome to another episode of The Rock Therapy Show on Musicians on the Record. It's not talk therapy, it's rock therapy, conversations with musicians and folks from the mental health field about music, about mental health, motivation, and mindset. I'm David Ward, licensed psychotherapist and unlicensed drummer. And today on the show, we're talking with amazing drummer and producer, Tony Braunagel. Tony has played with Bonnie Raitt, Taj Mahal, and Robert Cray, just to name a few, and he's produced many bands. We're going to talk about his music today as well as mental health, yoga, and hypnotherapy. We started off the interview with talking with Tony about how he even started with yoga. So, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the yoga, if we could, as far as how long you've been doing yoga. How has that helped you with your music, actually? Um, I, I, why did I start doing yoga? I don't know. It was one of those things where I met someone at a party one night, and she said she was a yoga instructor. It wasn't kind of any one of those kind of things. She said, yeah. I'm a yoga instructor. I went, yeah, crazy. And she <laughs> goes, uh, I, I went and took a class with her. And then I went and took another class with somebody else. And then I ended up with this little bitty, and it's, I think it's in this drawer, this little, here it is. It's unbelievable. It would be right here. Yoga Transformations. And I copied it out of somebody's book and stapled it together. And I started doing these poses. And then I started reading about the technique of it. And I, that was in the early 90s or something like that. And I started doing yoga almost every morning. I would get out of bed and do it. And what an improvement it made in my life. Uh, I was still overweight a little bit. I, it didn't help me lose weight. I realized later the only way to lose weight is to combine a certain amount of exercise with a diet situation. You've got to cut back on certain things that you eat or else you're not going to lose the weight. I don't care how many miles you run. So anyhow, I started doing the yoga and I really felt this whole thing that I, it, it's, it's funny how it, the improvement creeps into your body and your mind. And uh, you don't really notice it big time right off. But eventually, you realize that you can bend over here all the way down to the ground and pick something up and stand back up again. And at that age, it wasn't so, um, it wasn't, it, it, it didn't mean so much to me. It wasn't so significant as like now I can still reach over, bend something all the way down to the ground, pick it up. I can stand on one leg and touch the ground. You know what I mean? with my other, with my arm, outstretched arm, and stand back up again and not make any grunting noises. <laughs> That's pretty good. So, it is, yes. So I realized that very early on with it. And, and then I went in and out of doing it, and I never stayed to be like, I never inspired to be a yoga master or anything. But I, I've continued doing it, and I think I cranked up again uh, a lot more steady about uh, – 10 12 years ago again mm -hmm. and um it really really helps it helps i i was lifting weights as well i'm not really lifting weights now i i actually kind of prefer the muscles that i get from yoga as opposed to the muscles that i get from lifting weights i mean lifting weights makes you bulky and stronger in some ways but yoga is there's a i guess the right word is leaf there's a leaf sort of quality to your muscles and everything and I preferred how that felt on me. And um, it affects your whole body if you do it right. And I'd gone to classes and I started going again a couple of years ago to local classes because in my neighborhood, there's like three or four yoga studios within two blocks. I live in a great neighborhood here. The scenery is quite nice going in and out too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what you mean there. You know what I mean there. Yeah. Okay. But anyhow, um, I started going again and I, and I, and, and it got me back into the program pretty heavily. And, uh, and I realized that I knew enough that I didn't need to pay the money to go do it. And I, I ran into a friend, a drummer friend who was introduced to me by, uh, Eric Madsen, uh, a friend of, of, of Jonathan Mover at Drumhead magazine. And, and this guy's name is Stefan Storacci and he's a drummer and he wanted to take some drum lessons from me. So, but he's a yoga master. So we traded some yoga lessons and, just the few times that we sat down and he 
showed me the techniques better. I, it changed the way I did it. I slowed down. I didn't try to be impressive or anything. And I took more, I took longer into the, to the, to the poses and I, the breathing is the most important thing in yoga. And so it got to be better for me and I'm still doing it. I didn't do it today, but I did it yesterday and I did it probably the day before that. I do it three or four days a week, you know, and even if I only get 10 or 15 minutes, yeah. it's still effective. I'd like to sit down and do, you know, an hour or whatever, but you know, sure. it's, it's working for me. Well, and I, I, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I think at, 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 you know, at a certain age, um, we allow our bodies, we say, Oh, I'm just getting older. And that's true indeed. But I think that you should, uh, you should try to work on it a little bit if hmm. you can, because if you do, you could help yourself get around and have a little bit more fun, a little longer, as well as you won't be a burden on other people. <laughs> right. 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 So let's talk about that then, Tony, the, the flexibility that comes from yoga, as well as like you're talking about the breathing and the, yeah. the times that I've done it, it's very much helped me slow down. How does that translate to you musically on the drum kit or any other instrument? Well, I find I'm sitting upright and I'm not even thinking about it. And, and, the, and, the, and the balance that you get from, you know, doing both limbs all the way over and twisting up and turning around backwards and defying gravity and, and, and stretching muscles in a, in a way you, you don't normally stretch your muscles uh, and ligaments and, and uh, joints and not putting a lot of pressure on joints or ligaments, but making sure that you're stretching them the right way. When you sit down at the drum kit, you just sit there upright and you're balanced. And, uh, I know it, it's, I know it helps. I know it helps the, uh, the rhythm of my muscles, you know what I mean? Cause they're, they're just, they're, they're a little bit more ready, you know, and you, you bring all this blood into them and everything. So it's, and I don't, I'm not talking about doing it and going on stage. I'm just saying in general, if I do it in the morning and go on stage that night, it's going to, I'm going to feel different. Definitely. Is there a certain type of yoga that you do? I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't brand it one. I've I've seen uh, Hatha and and uh, Iyengar and uh, two or three different types that, that I've you know I've looked at uh, what's the crazy one that's really I never do hot yoga. I never do hot. Oh yoga. yes, the hot yoga, the yeah. Bikram yoga, which my wife and I just watched the uh, the Netflix. If you haven't seen it, there's a Netflix documentary on him and the whole movement. It was very intense. Just saw it yeah. last night. I, I tried it. I tried it, and I went. I, it didn't make any sense to me, and especially after I studied with Stefan a couple of times, I went. I don't need this. I mean, I can go in the backyard in the summertime when it's really hot with a shirt <laughs> off, when no one's out there, and just me, uh, you know, and and my mat, and I can get in the hot sun, and I can get plenty hot and plenty sweaty. But uh, it, the slow sweat that comes from doing yoga long enough is I think better for you because little by little it moves toxins around your body and you drink a bunch of water afterwards and try to relax a little bit and don't sit there and start throwing toxins back in your body, whether it's caffeine or eating bad food or whatever. Uh, you, you, it, 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 it tends to uh, sustain you a little bit longer. Um, I'm sorry. You asked me the question was again. Yeah, no, I, we, I was just asking about what type of yoga. That oh you yeah. 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 Um, I don't stick to one. I, I've, I've learned, uh, you know, Kundalini poses and I've learned, you know, I, Iyengar poses and the Hatha yoga and, um, Hatha is probably the closest to what I, I stick to. But what I learned from some Iyengar classes was how to stay in them a certain way and longer and how well it really feels to finally relax yourself in that pose. When, when you got in it, you were like, ah, 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 ah. and if you keep breathing and relaxing, next thing you know, you're flattened out, you know, and you've stretched it and you, you know, and then you come out of it slow. So that's what that taught me, but uh, not too much Kundalini or whatever. So, to, you know, yeah. And, and that's cool. So it sounds like you've never really had the stage fright, but you've played with folks like Bonnie Raitt, Robert Cray, Taj Mahal, but that's, uh, that's been manageable for you. It sounds like. Yeah, I've had, uh, I've had anxiety, you know, in, in the past, uh, I had some anxiety issues, since we're talking about the therapeutic side of this whole thing, um, I had anxiety issues uh, starting in 2013 after a, a, a loss. I lost my I lost my mother, and my father my father's death didn't. I, not I think it's my father. I loved him dearly, sure. but the the death affected me in a different way. 
his his death. And when my mother p- passed away, I didn't realize uh, that cutting the umbil- umbilical cord like I was, and as close as I was to her emotionally, we were kind of tuned in psychically in a lot of ways. Mm. That what what a, a loss it was to me. Something was there was this big space, and 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 I and I didn't know how to fill it up. And uh, I started getting anxiety attacks right after that. <laughs> they were oh. intense, man. Yeah. Sorry and to it, it wasn't, it wasn't good to, it wasn't easy to deal with. And, you know, um, you start going to things, you know, certain crutches to feel better, whether it's a, a substance or, a, or, a, or, you know, take this, this will settle you down from the doctor. And then you go, I don't want to take all this stuff. You know what I mean? I was actually put on antidepressants for two days and I went, no. I'm not depressed. I'm not taking antidepressants, you know? So uh, I got over that and um, figured my way through it. It wasn't easy. It didn't, it didn't go as smooth as, as I probably could have if I'd have figured it out earlier what I eventually figured out. And that was going to my acupuncturist, who's a brilliant woman, healer. She is so spiritual. It's fantastic. It's she, it doesn't matter who you are. You don't have to believe in all of this stuff. You go to her and you get up off the table and you go, go. Uh, okay, I get it. There's something really cool going on here. She's several of my sort of non-believing friends went to her and they walked out of there going, no, there's nothing like that woman. She's like incredible. (laughs) She was helping me deal with it. And then she said, I got an idea. This is very important, David. She said, I have an idea. And I suggest this for a lot of people. One One more time I'll say, Jeannie said, I have an idea. This is working. A lot of things you're doing is working, but a lot is not working. There's something going on up here that's crowding up your conscious subconsciousness. It's probably that's what's causing it. That was her thing. Right? I think you should go see the hypnotherapist. And I said, all right, I'm open. I, I'm not afraid of that. I would believe in that, you know, enough to get a, a, you know, a session and see what it's like. So we did the research and she found a couple of people and I went to the one person I chose from his video on his uh, website. I went, I want to go talk to that guy. You got to feel like you're going to entrust these people because it's, you're opening up, you know? And I sat down with them and immediately my anxiety was gone for at least three days. Not, not a touch of it. And I went back again and it was gone for three weeks and I'm not making this up. I went away for three one, three weeks. I needed it again. I got it again. I was gone for three months. And then after that, I needed to touch up about every six months. Uh, I don't think I've been for a year now. And the reason why I go is to make sure that the connection that I made between consciousness and subconsciousness that I've talked to now is still there. And it is. And the things that it opens up for you completely in other ways that you think is pretty cool. It's subtle but it's pretty cool that you can open up talking your subconsciousness and, and asking it to not, not bring this over here to this party here. Let's leave this out of the consciousness today. Mm-hmm. And, and it worked for me. And I have, um, uh, I won't mention names, but I've, uh, I've told a few other people about it when we talked about it and went, you know, I'm having problems as well. Musicians. Yeah. And, uh, and they said, really? Yeah. I said, try this. And a couple of them have gone to the same exact guy mm-hmm. and it felt better. It's powerful, it's you know. Powerful. Yeah. So, and I'm curious because uh, my my mother in law used to be a hypnotherapist as well. And what you're talking about, Tony, is the power of grief, <coughs> and loss, and and anxiety that can come with that. Uh, and there's all you know many roads lead to Rome here. So, yeah. but but it sounds like for you, this this modality of hypnotherapy really helped you calm the anxiety do you, can you share a little bit about what the sessions were like what what happened even well the guy kind of figures out here he for me i don't know how what other practitioners do in this this field but this particular guy uh he wanted to feel out how much of a uh, um what is it uh, how much of an emotional and how much of an open person i am how you know uh I, you know, I think it's, it's 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 you're driven between two forces you're either an emotional or you're sexual and, and it doesn't get into the, you know, sexuality, but you're either, you know, so I'm kind of a half and half, a bit more of the aggressive s- sexual, but I've got enough of the emotional that I understand both sides. 
whereas I'm empathetic to, 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 to someone as not, as opposed to pushing my way around with them. And, um, that was one of that, that started in the beginning and I'm kind of scratching my head going, really, is this part of this? And I guess later on, I see why, because he's trying to figure out who you are when he's talking to you for, and, and when he's making suggestions. But we talked about all the problems. I gave him my background and every time I went to him, the, 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 the conversations graduated into other areas. And so the last time I went to him a year ago, it was a whole other area that we talked about. And I came out of it going, I think I rebelled a little bit. I think I went, no, I don't, it's not a big deal. I don't get it. A month later, I went, you know, he was right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so hate it when that happens. I, yeah. I do that too. Well, you yeah. hate it and you love it because right. you want, you want the revelation, yeah. but yeah. at the same time, you know, if you let your ego go, it's not going to bother you. So, but, um, but I, I, I got something from it every time and I still think about it. And I, if I'm in a situation where, I'm walking around and I'm in a dither that day and, and I go, well, it's not, let's see how much have I had a lot of caffeine today or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or what have I done? You know, I not had enough rest. Uh, you know, I had a glass of wine last night, maybe I had two or three or whatever. I was partying and I didn't think about it. I woke up the next day and you're a little bit, a little bit fuzzy. And at, at those moments is when it can come on. And it, and it has for me for ages now. So I feel knock on wood. I've, I've, it's been, a, it's done a great job for me. And That's I really great. suggest it for anybody going through any type of anxiety to go talk about it like that. It's different than a psychiatrist because I, I had a, a shrink for a little while um, for another reason. And uh, after my, my marriage broke up okay. and that helped and he was great and it's good. But, but then this came back later on after my mother passed away. Yeah. I, I never realized that I was so vulnerable in all these ways, David. I, I, it's hard for me to, it was hard for me to accept Sure. going to a psychiatrist and talking about it. It was hard for me to accept that this was like actually a thing that I was actually was suffering from anxiety. It was really hard for me to accept it because I felt like I'm, I'm a tough guy. I don't need this. I'm a drummer, you know, for right. Christ's sake, you know, right. Right. I get on stage and command the band. You know? That's right. Like, That's right. BS, you know what I mean? Right. So, uh, it, it works, and I think that anybody that's going through that, uh, musician or not, if you're seeing this, if you're having problems, think about it and look at someone in your area that you can go see and talk to them. And if you don't like the person you're talking to at first, go see somebody else. I really think that a lot of it has to do with the person. You know, if you feel something with them, then you can trust them, you know, and some people can't be hypnotized. Some people just can't be, they don't believe it. Yeah, that's right. I like going under. I like going under. I don't, I, I don't, I don't really resist. I, I let the, I let the process take over. I can feel it. I can hear the suggestion. And I go, he's suggesting this. Do I let it happen? Uh, or do what do I, and next thing you know, you don't even know anymore. You're done. You're in. So it's kind of neat. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate your, your courage and your bravery talking about all this stuff, Tony, because, you know, as guys, especially, we don't, uh, that's not okay to ask for help. But, you know, we're all human. We all need help yeah. sometimes. And like you're saying, you know, sometimes we get chemically hijacked. I talk with folks of like anxiety that that, you didn't order up some anxiety on Amazon. Right. I mean, it just started happening and uh, it's that's normal after a a loss like that. Can you describe if you would, because you know, a lot of folks stereotypically have the, the TV or movie version of what hypnosis or hypnotherapy is of like somebody waving the gold watch in front of you, putting you in a spell or whatever, at least with this, person that you saw can you describe the process a little please yeah I, I, I guess i wouldn't be giving it away i mean he basically i close my eyes and you sit back in a chair and you relax and you take a few deep breaths and you just get to the point where it's good for anybody to do anytime you're feeling any anxiety or or tension or whatever it's just to sit and relax it's what meditation what's so great about meditation and then he just makes a suggestion to uh touch my forehead with my hand or something or raise my left hand or what, whatever in the air, put it over my head or whatever until it, and, and that's, he, he picks a movement, whatever it is. And when he does, he gets me in it. And I, I'm in the mo- I'm in the spell then. And I know I'm hypnotized. I know I'm, you know, what's going on the whole time. I'm in it, but uh, this is what I like about the power of it. Getting into the subconscious is, you know, you're in it and you could probably just pop out of it mm-hmm. if you forced it. Right but you don't force it and you don't let it just passively happen either. 
and you're you're staying in this in this kind of zone here and while he's in there you talk about things he talks about things with you and uh, then when he brings you out you're like you i could feel immediately the relief mm. i could feel the relief like within 10 minutes yeah five Amazing. minutes whatever yeah, yeah. it's in, in a where you get in your car and you drive home and you're like that was really Cool. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and it sounds powerful because it's just calming your central nervous system, right? It's yeah, just and it's telling your subconsciousness to to not throw those because then you start to feel. I'm, I know I'm getting into it. I hope this isn't too far. No, this is it. great. This is rock therapy. Tony, this is what we want to talk. Tony about. Tony Bronigle, the drummer's talking about his hypnotherapy. Love it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I'm not afraid. I'm not ashamed. Good for you. Um, Good for you. Um, it might help somebody. Exactly. Uh, That's right. You, the point the of sub, it. Subconscious is, is in there. And some, some people are like compare that like to the devil or whatever, but there, it's not, I, let's not go there. Right. It's just this conditioning that happens to you in your, in, in your, from patterns over the years. And are you, you got it from, you know, through DNA, you know, you inherited it or whatever, or uh, you, you were just, at one point in your life, you were traumatized or whatever, uh, whatever case, what might charge it, uh, cause the, uh, the, the, uh, the situation for you to have that. And you, you just, um, you start to deal with that voice and you don't let that voice tell this thing over here, your consciousness, how to feel. And you separate the two and the subconscious is extremely powerful and, and, and much larger than the consciousness. We don't use enough of that. If we could figure out how to use our subconsciousness consciousness more, we'd be a lot more powerful individuals. And they say that some I've read were some, some kind of genius type people are those that can split it up and move the subconsciousness, a large amount of it into their consciousness and use all of that extra energy that's out there. It's kind of like it's a, the Akashic records or whatever, yeah. you know? right, right. which I'm, I'm not trying to make fun of anybody yeah, or get off right. base here, you know, <laughs> but it, it makes sense to me. And I, and I've used it and I believe in it. And, um, it's it's good. It's quite good. Well, you know, I, I love that. But you, you know, the the unconscious, subconscious, whatever you want to call it, um, it's always on our shoulder anyway. It's some of the self talk that we talk to ourselves all the time anyway. And whether it's positive or it's the the uh, itty bitty shitty committee on our shoulder talking, Perfectly talking, put. right, yeah. talking trash to us. This sounds more intentional of really trying to work with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is that voice you're talking about. It is the little shitty, itty shitty. What do you say? Shitty, itty bitty itty, shitty committee. Yeah. Itty bitty shitty. You'll love that. Okay. Uh, I'll use it. It Please. is that. It is that. It's that voice. You hear, you're, you, you get in the car and you start driving somewhere and, and all of a sudden someone honks at you or gets away. Well, you just, now you got into a mental fight with them. Yeah, you, blah, 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 blah. you call it, that guy, if you, if I see you, you know, if those are the things that that's what it is, that's what's going on. It's those voices in your head that are starting all these fights or this conflict are being negative saying, Oh, I don't have enough money. What am I going to do? And blah, blah, blah. And you stop and you change your consciousness to where this conflict means nothing. You're all safe. Keep driving. Mm. You have plenty of money in your bank account to pay your bills and you're not starving right now. Right. You're a working musician. You have other gigs coming. Look at your calendar. It's fine. Look at the things that you've done as opposed to looking at just being afraid and that's fear you know mm -hmm. that's fear there's fear and love and right and you either you choose one or the other do right. i go over here and try to enjoy my life by looking at all the positive stuff you know um, right. progressive aspects positive aspects of my life yeah. or do i go over here and let that get in the way of everything else right then you damage and spoil and and you know and you lose relationships and mm. and you don't have fun right yeah, I think really well put, because so it, it may not always come out as stage fright, but we can have many levels of fear going going on, whether it's that financial insecurity you're talking about or the inner fights in our head with somebody, whether it's somebody in the band or whatever, oh, yeah. right? It's, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that's, that is so typical of, of a whole bunch of musicians working together for a long time. Right. You're all great. You're all brothers or, and brothers and sisters and the whole, you know, this mission to go out there every night, go from Detroit to Chicago, to Madison, to Milwaukee, to New York, to Boston, you know, we're going to go on every night, every, we're going to take a great show and you get this pride and everything. But after a while, someone puts their thing on top of your thing over there and much of your thing out of the way or, or ate your sandwich or 
whatever silly little thing and you go why well, you you know and you can and you get mad at them and then next thing you know and you don't know why and of course it goes away but you're always trying to like you know stay in and in, 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 in stay in, in, uh, in a good place with everybody you're working with and keep it positive but it can happen very easily because as i explained earlier the traveling situation puts you it, it's it makes you very vulnerable to yeah. To situations like that happening and you just can't listen to those inner voices right that must re remember that when you get on stage you're all out there for doing something really special and really magic right now you know yeah because it's not everybody that gets to uh play music for a living right and and no. and have that in their lives so yeah that is very special but it, that must be weary being on the road and you know Somebody ate your sandwich or took a solo over your music or whatever. <laughs> and go. like the ego gets involved, right? Oh God, does it ever. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it, there, there's a lot of philosophies that say, you know, dumping the ego, getting rid of the ego, shoving it out of the way is, is very important. And I pretty much agree with it for the most part. It's finding your way to what you, that what it's finding your way to where the ego leads you creatively or helps you or keeps you or holds you or whatever that you can do without the ego getting in its way in the way of it. It's, it's kind of a funny thing is, you know, it's a spiritual approach to being able to be strong and, and do what you need to do and staying after it and getting on stage and being able to play with all of that vim vigor verve and you know and and uh and, and backing yourself up with you know the musicality of playing for 20 30 40 years or whatever right. and using that every night and being able to source all of that that you have in you when you play you know and letting all that flow through you and mm. uh and don't let the ego get in the way of it and if that guy wants to solo over you smile at him and you know right get him back solo over his next time no i'm just kidding right. <laughs> 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 yeah and uh yeah the ego is a is a trip right it's it's a tough one i i've heard uh and i kind of fall in line with this is uh, of like ego is like a little kid you can't stuff him in the trunk but you don't want him driving the bus either right. so yeah. it needs to be in the back seat in a car seat nice and safely buckled up but in its proper perspective because i don't think we can fully get rid of it right no. that's a tough that's a tough it's thing I mean, you could work on it and try, but you could sit there and meditate all day long as well and try to not like, you know, let ever let the ego in, you know what I mean? Right. And, and even then, I think, uh, 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 unless you're absolutely perfect and so, uh, you know, yeah. the, the greatest Buddhist monk of all, uh, whatever, you've, you, uh, you've elevated yourself to a level to where your ego is just never going to inv get involved. It's right. going to be hard because we're all still very much human beings. Sure. It makes us who we are. You know, we're, we're animals that were put on earth with the consciousness to take care of everything else, the animals and the earth. You know what I mean? I mean, so we, we have a special, we have a special thing going on, you know, a, you know, we, we love our pets and everything and they're really special and they're really smart too, but we're here to take care of them. So we're given all these extra powers. I know I'm getting out there now, man. Wow. Oh, I love it. It's great. It's rock therapy, Tony. <laughs> go for it. You go wherever you want. So. <laughs> but I also want to talk about some of the music projects you've got going on that that you have clearly body, mind, and spirit worked on all of this because uh, you're a really busy guy in the music business too, not just the drummer. Um, but, but I want to start with the project you're working with, uh, with Taj Mahal, please tell us uh, this, would you call it a comeback for Taj? What's going on there? Well, Taj is out there. And I mean, Taj, uh, had a Grammy year before last or something like that from his project with Keb Mo and Keb and he put a, a, a tour and a, an album together and they did quite well with that. So it's, it, yeah, I could call it a comeback of sorts, but I don't think Taj has gone away. So I can't really say it's a comeback. I would say what happened here is there's this band called the Phantom Blues Band, which I've been a member of since the mid 90s. Uh, Taj Mahal gave us that name. I started working with him in the early 90s, and the first record I played on was called Dance in the Blues. It got a Grammy nomination. The second one was called Phantom Blues. It got a Grammy nomination. We went on the road to back him with that studio band. He gave us a name, called us the Phantom Blues Band. Then we made Senior Blues, which got a Grammy nomination and won. And then we made the live record 
Shouting in Key, which also won a Grammy, which I got a chance to produce, which kind of got me kickstarted in doing that because I'd wanted to do that and it fell in my lap and I took the opportunity and ran with it. Uh, in about 2002, 2003, we stopped traveling with Taj so, so as much as we were for different reasons, business reasons and whatnot. And we were all kind of, I was kind of done with being gone all the time as well during that period. And he wanted to make some changes. So we just kind of worked together occasionally and we would go on blues cruises and pick up a big festival somewhere or whatever, you know, and we decided that we hadn't, since we hadn't made a record in a long time, it was overdue that we have a Phantom Blues Band record with Taj because all four of those records, as I said, got nominations and did really well. They actually sold records in the blues genre because he's more like blues world as you know, an Americana as well. Yeah. So um, we started my, the bass player in the band, my buddy Larry Fulcher and I started and we just sat down one day. So we got to do this. And we were completely discouraged because we weren't going to get any money from anybody and we weren't going to figure this out. And we went, no, 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 no. So we we're, we we're about to end our phone call. And I just said, you know, I don't accept this. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I said, we're, we're stronger and better than this. We can make this happen. Let's get on the phone and tell everybody. I'm not going to tell you what I said, but anyhow, we put together a message and a mission with all the guys and everybody pitched in and we got Taj on the phone. He, he agreed. So without a record label or the backing or anything, because our guitar player, Johnny Lee shell is an excellent engineer and has a great studio, which is where I produce most of my records right here in studio city. Uh, Johnny had a studio and Johnny went, well, sure, let's do it. So we've been working on it for a few years, but it's about to be finished. Wow. And it's kind of, in a way, what we wanted was a thumbprint of all of the, most of the styles that we'd done. Well, all of them, we tried to hit on all of them, reggae, jazz, uh, uh, some Calypso, some New Orleans, some Man. real down dirty blues, some rock and blues, some hard R&B. Yeah. which over the years we made all of those types of music with Taj and Amazing. we tried to hit on all of that. And we have, and I'm pretty proud of it. Um, we're at the, the last creaking part of the process here, which is always tough shoving it through the gate. You know what I mean? You're done. Get out there. You know, right. Right. We're at, we're, we're at that point right now. And I think it's going to be, um, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't want to be too sound too confident or anything, but I think it's going to be a head turner for a lot of people. They're going to listen to it. Go, oh, we've been waiting too long for this. Yeah, that's, yeah. You know. that's really great. That's exciting to hear. And when when might we be able to hear it? And where? My wish, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is by spring of 2020. So okay. we're we're working at that right now. Okay. So right around there. Yeah. So you guys, you know you went outside the model of the record industry. Uh, and of course all that's been changing for years now anyway. Yeah. yeah. And said, we're doing this ourselves. So congratulations on that. How, as a producer, engineer, as a drummer, whatever, how do you know when it's finished? Uh, I asked a very famous producer friend of mine this one day when I first started producing and he said, when the plastic is around the CD and it's in the store. <laughs> he okay. said, when you have to take the plastic off of it. And I go, and I go, Oh really? He goes, yeah. I said, because I was going through something and I was producing at the time. And there were a lot of last minute changes from the artist. Uh, I don't want to change. It's not good enough. I want to, let's, let's cut another song. I got one more song. I want to redo my vocal. I don't like the mix of this. And you keep going through this process and, like I say, it's like shoving it through the gate. You keep until you finally get it to where they go. Anything else? No, it's good. Push it through. Then you go, wait a minute. One more thing. Too late. We've gone to mastering. You know what I mean? So um, how do you know? You, you, you get a feeling, you know, I'm, I'm coming up on finishing this one project about the guy I mentioned to you earlier, Phil Colombato, you know, started writing. So once we started, he started writing songs and he couldn't stop. I cut two or three songs with him and he kept writing songs. He was living out in the desert in that heat in an, in an RV. So what are you doing? He just chose to live that way for a while. And um, he's not destitute, but uh, it inspired a whole lot of desert rat songs. I love it. They're, they're really good. And it got really spiritual and biblical as well in some ways, you know? 
So uh, uh, I say biblical, not religious, but biblical yeah. sounding, right. you know. Yeah. And um, uh, I, I we're 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 rounding it up here. We're probably gonna. It looks like record. We've got a concept for the last song or two, and that's probably where we're going to stop. And I like the fact that he's agreeing with me that we need to chop it up. I told him, I said, we need to compartmentalize all of this material you have. I can go back to the other stuff and re-record some of it and, and fix some of it to come up to the same standard as what we want to record or make it all feel like it's one. Uh, but I think if we're going to do this record this way and you want to do continue on this concept, let's make this concept complete for this album and get that out there. And then we can go back and source other things and release singles or bonus tracks or something later on. Hmm. So uh, I'm, you know, we're pretty close and um, I'm going to be down there. I'm going to, I know this is going to come to a point where I'm going to go. I like everything except that one word on the vocal there. You know what I mean? And I didn't like that guitar note there. And I think that we can, uh, you know, fix that. Uh, you know what I mean? I'll be doing, I'll be fine tuning right here in this room with my big speakers and this is my office studio room. And um, I don't really record here, but I monitor everything here and, and I keep track of it. And, and all, all things start here, whether it's writing with Coco Montoya or another artist or, or putting together, you know, the whole uh, the, the concept of the record or whatever, little by little, I do it mostly in this room right here, so. Yeah. So you really, just like a movie director, the music producer, like what you're doing, you're just every single detail. Even more so now, more so. because Dave, because um, because you mentioned earlier the record company situation, and um, record companies have closed in and gotten smaller, and their their uh, sight of the future or whatever. They they have to see an artist that they know is going to sell a certain number of records either digitally because there's no physical sales in the end CDs are gone pretty much. You can go to different marketing angles like vinyl is big in some ways. Most importantly, the act is to be able to get on the road, which means that they need an agent or have to already be on the road. Well, those are, those are big hurdles for an act to just get an agent like that. They gotta be really special. They gotta be the kind of act that the agents are already going to be after because the way you get an agent is, Agent says, how many butts are you putting in seats? You know what I mean? Well, we're playing regionally and we're playing clubs that put, we put 250 in and, you know, that's not bad if you're starting out, you know, but can you do that every night and continue to do it 150 dates out of the year where you can sell physically your own record, your CD or vinyl, or can we use all of the social media and make you go the same kind of way that the pop music industry part of, part of the industry goes. And um, both. So for me, the modern day, um, the modern day way of getting it done and the challenge here is to be able to have a vision from the first phone call from the artist. I've got songs, Tony Bronigle, Will you produce me? Yes, let's get together and talk and see if we can work together. Listen to the songs. Oh, these are all great. Or eh, two of them are good. Let's work on those two. Let's get you some help from another songwriter. And the, it, all part of the process, like you just said, creative till we get the right song list and the songs being the most important thing. Like a cook chef goes to the market to get ingredients. I got to have those songs. And then I go find the musicians for those songs. And I have my circle of guys that I tend to use because I like the dependability of what I get out of them creatively and technically in the studio. So session players we're talking about. Session players, people that know how to print because there are a lot of great musicians that can play really well. Drummers who have great chops and can play, but they don't print really well because they're not sure how they're hitting the drums and what that process is going into the microphone that it comes out. Sometimes they hit them too hard, you know? Interesting. Sometimes they don't have the right, they overdrive the whole thing and they push it too hard. Whereas you pull back sometimes and you make it a little bit more focused on certain parts of the drum kit. Same with the bass player. Find those notes that go right where the groove needs to go. Yeah. Unless you're creating kind of a very funky soul kind of thing and you want the push and pull between the bass player and the drummer, you know? Finding guitar players that can kind of glue 
you know, and keyboard players that find parts that you end up wanting to orchestrate because they're so brilliant. Interesting. You know, those kind of players. And then when you do that, you get those guys in the room. And I don't know if I said this in my last interview, but one of my favorite things about this, it's like having a room full of racehorses that are ready to take off. And you walk in and you have some songs for them and you listen and they got, and, and you know, the neurosis and everything of wanting to play is there. It's not stage fright. It's, it's, it's that same thing we talked about uh, wanting to play and you go, I just got to get these guys going and you give them the first song. And once they start playing now, there's this flow of energy, you know, the creative energy in the session and the artist sitting there going, wow, these guys are doing this for me. You know, and I'm sitting there playing drums on it and barely directing, just barely directing because I hired the right guys. You know, I don't have to sit down and say, will you play this part here for me on the bass? Because I can only barely show them how to do that. I don't want a bass player that I have to show something to. Right. I want you to have suggest, a, you know. You have a shorthand with some of these musicians at this every, point. Every single one of them. Yeah. Two words and they go, oh, okay. You know, on the bridge, they're arpeggiated. Oh, okay, I got it. Don't do it there. All right, you know. Right. Give me the full chord there on the verse, okay, you know. And, and, I, and arrange it on the spot. Sometimes we arrange it right on the spot, and then I go to an, a horn arranger or, you know, I end up doing the background vocal arranging pretty much myself just from uh, conceptually hearing things. I know I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm not really good at it. But I, I once again, I hear background singers who come in and they like to work in this situation with me because it's creative and we're all friendly and we all have fun and have a good time so they love doing sessions for me and they come in and sing for me and i don't have to tell them a lot i mean i so i want something here i underline the line i give them a sheet of paper i want y'all to sing harmony on this and unison on this and i want a really high part on this and that's about all the direction i do and then we get it right because they're good they know how to get it right so th that, that's, that's the part of producing that I really love, you know, yeah. that, that, that flow of energy. Uh, I will continue to do it just for that alone. Hopefully I can pay my bills doing it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful as well, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So how do bands today, you know, we were talking about the ego a few minutes ago, when you have to tell a band who may want to go into the studio and cut their own music uh, that you guys – come in, but I'm going to have my other musicians. How, how are they reacting or responding these days? <laughs> Talking about the ego. <laughs> oh, I, I have to say being on both sides of that, being replaced because of a producer, being in a band and being replaced because of a producer, uh, and being the producer who's told that artist that exact thing you said, they, the band can't be on it. And also being the guy who's produced, sorry, that is, that's replaced, being a session drummer that's replaced the other guy. It's a strange feeling. Being on the bad side of it where you get shoved out feels horrible. The rejection, it's like this in the stomach. You know what I mean? It's really bad. I, it, I, it's very hard to cope with, very hard to cope with. It doesn't help the ego, right? But I try to, when I have to do that, I try to really reach out to the guys and talk to them and say, listen, I'm looking for something here to make the artists that you work with and you go on the road with get to another level. And most of the time, probably 70 or 80% of the time, eventually they get it. When they hear the record, if we've really done a great job on the record and they hear the record, they go, Oh, I get it. They, some of them will say, 30% of them will say, I could have played that. Yeah, but would you have thought of that? And would you have made it sound that way? Because then I go see them play live and some of them, them are really copying what we did because I tell them to, at first, authenticate this recording because this is a new thing for you. This is new material. It, we're giving you a new sound to further your career with get your band or th authenticate as much as you can and then once you get in the role of it you'll turn into your own thing i do the same thing when i teach drums you know i try to get a drummer to authenticate parts something from the from a style from an old historical legend or whatever a drummer where we choose something that you know i go i got that from this 
person. Uh, here's Al Jackson Jr. plays it this way. I want you to listen to this really close. Let's copy Al Jackson Jr. So we get you on the path of going where you're going to go and get your style of playing that style of, of groove, you know? So I try to get the guys in the bands to get their artists to do that. And I go out and see them. And I, it's funny. I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to pat on the back for it at all, but it's really, it feels really nice when some of them go, Hey man, it was really fun playing your parts. And I go, I want to get a tear. You know what I mean? It's like, it really, it really gets me emotionally sure. that someone would say that. And, and uh, that, that's a huge reward for sure. me to, you know, to, to, for someone to say that, not for my ego or anything, just to see that. Feels good. It, right? it, oh, it feels yeah. good, but you got across. Sure. The message was delivered. Right. And um, then I've had bands where I couldn't and didn't, and I coached them. Mm -hmm. And um, in those cases, some of those would have turned out better. Of course, if I had, you know, if I'd have taken the singer and brought him to Los Angeles or, or New York or wherever, you know, and, and used the guys I wanted to use. And, but uh, we get through those. And I get through those really, really well. I do those as well. And, and you know, the drummer, you know, uh, who didn't want to tune his drums a certain way. And <laughs> so I had to figure out how to get around his, his young ego. And he was a good drummer. He was solid aggressive you know and and that's what the music needed and it was oh i like these drums and i like these drum heads and i like these cymbals and i, I said well eh, that snare doesn't have the right so sound to be recorded you might like it live but recording it's not going to work you know i don't know so do, let, let, let me just work on a little bit okay work on a little bit i'm going to change the heads in your drums no i like those drum heads i said okay let's try these drum heads though so we put these drum heads on and i tuned the drum kit up and i got it got the snare and everything and then I brought cymbals with me and um and I said use these cymbals well I like these they're louder and I said that's the point see what I'm trying to tell you is you're overdriving the microphones with that and all you're going to hear is really loud when we go to master we put any high frequency on it all I'm going to hear is your crash cymbal and it's going to cover everything else up and I have to try to get it out of the way basically what I'm telling you if you don't let me help you get a sound here I'm not going to turn you up in the mix. Mm. Oh, really? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. So a couple of days, second day into tracking, he, he comes, he's standing in the control room going, he's digging it. And he goes, sounds pretty good, huh? <laughs> he goes, yeah, you sound great. <laughs> and uh, I left it at that. He goes, All right. you can turn me up. I said, yeah, I think I can turn you up now. You know, <laughs> so it was so cute. It's so funny. He was a young guy, probably in his mid twenties or something like that. And, yeah. uh, it's just, it's the whole process is really great it's 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 very rewarding even you know i mean when you get grammy nomination or win a grammy or you get blues music award nominations or win an award or it's awesome or people you see the billboard charts and your records on it and you see people write uh reviews of your stuff that it, it, it's it's nice because they liked it and they say great things and everything that's that's kind of that's what we're after Sure. artists you know we hopefully like i said i just want to continue doing this and pay my bills right you know right well you're clearly doing more than that and and you're certainly doing something right with all the the great music that you've made and and been a part of tony and uh you know i i keep hearing stuff i'd love to hear you know because you're a drummer and and producer as well what is a top you know you said a little bit of like tuning and turning down but you know, I, I've seen interviews with other drummers like uh, Taylor Hawkins of the Foo Fighters, who's a mm. fantastic drummer. But wow. he's talked he's talked about, you know, it's a whole different game in the studio. And so, you know, if I came to you and I said, you know, I'm not a ready for prime time drummer. So uh, what would you tell me as far as how could I be more prepared for the studio or any musician? Well, first of all, is you have to play the song. Number one, you're in there to play the song and to make that singer sound good. You're not in there to bring attention to yourself. So when you play things that don't serve both of those things I mentioned, the song and, the, and, and making the singer sound good, and you're, you're playing to bring attention to yourself, you're already doing wrong. Even if you don't have the greatest sounding snare drum or drum kit in the world, you're already doing something wrong. And the guys that, that do it right could play on a shitty drum set and still make it work. And that's what you have to remember if you're gonna go in the studio and work with somebody. 
because it's not going to go back. It's not live. It, you know, which goes by you once it's there, it repeats and you hear it over and over and over and over. So your expression is very important that you caught it then. I mean, I, I've been embarrassed by my playing, you know, where I've listened back to something and go, why did I play that? You know, why did I let that happen? I shouldn't have played that there, you know? And, uh, it's taught, it taught me a lot, you know, the humility of, of being, knowing that that process has to be, should be carried out that way and pulling it off and executing it is, uh, uh, that's the whole thing really, honestly. Yeah, you know, so you really... work on your technique and your time and you work on your sounds and you get, you get, they always, they always told me when I first started working, the more you record, the better you're going to get at it. The more you sing and you record your voice, the better you're going to hear your voice. You're going to get better and better and better, you know, as you do it. Well, I've been doing it for a long time. Right. So I should be getting a little bit better. Right. And, um, and uh, I, I, over the years, I've evolved definitely because uh, I've tried to keep that, that, play the song, man. Play, I don't care how fast you can play right. triplets and doesn't Jerry, matter, right? Whatever, it, they ain't going to sell a record. Right. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite sam sayings was from an old record company guy many years ago, and, you know, it was kind of a joke. He said, why don't we, you want to end up in the five court on the bridge or the race five or, you know, and one guy would, no, I don't like this race five. I, let's, no, I don't like the fifth either. Let's do the bridge a different way, you know. And the, and the, and the old guy, producer, over in the, sitting over in the chair goes, but will it affect sales? <laughs> uh, oh, I, I could have done it. that with a New York accent and it would have been a little bit more in character no but that's really the bottom line right like yeah. get uh, get perspective of what's really important right so yeah. and I love that play the song serve the song I hear that from so many different artists that that's the bottom line it is indeed it I, is I indeed. love that so when you're thinking songs if I can maybe continue this thread you mentioned a minute ago as a producer if a band brings in whatever six seven demos and you hear two that are good and the rest of like so, tell me about your ear what are you listening for is it uh, just more of a feeling or does it move you or does it not move you how do you decide those, all of those things it's a all feeling those. it's got to move you um i'm way into lyrics uh sounding like they come out of that singer's mouth, like it should come out of their mouth. And if they wrote it and they like what they wrote, but they're not making it sound like it was theirs, then my, my message to them is, you wrote this, this is your story, convince me. When you sing this, convince me that that's your story. I'm not feeling that from you right now. Let that out, let that emotion out. You, this guy, you know, did you wrong. You know, he, he, he ran around on you. He did something wrong and you, you know, you don't feel good about it. And you're, uh, t tell us about that. Let's hear that. Let's feel that. Let, let me feel that. Or if they're writing the lyrics and they're not exposing themselves enough. Vulnerability is a huge, wonderful factor in songs and songwriting. Exposing yourself. The vulnerability is very attractive. And it always has been. <clears throat> If you listen to any great delicious ballads over the years or songs that really grab people, whether they're male, whether they're male or female or whatever, or even a group, you know, when you when they when they're giving you're giving something up a little bit about yourself, then that gets into the narrative of your emotional expression, and it should be there, and that's what gets a song across. Even you know, try to avoid cliches. Not too many cliches, but cliches are part of the the the, the I'll say the English language because most of the music we listen to is in English, except for the Latin market. And, you know, um, I'll listen the listen, music that you grew up and that I grew up with and we listen to. Um, yeah. So we have to try to use the English language as best we can. There are cliches that are in the English language that are okay. There's some moon June gloom stuff that, ooh, leave it out. You know, right. just try to. Think more like conversation because conversation will get across, you know, either conversation or real narrative mm -hmm. and get those things across to where both of those are communicating to the listener. Well, and that's fascinating too, right there, Tony, is that you're talking about you're, you're kind of being a little bit of a therapist in the room as a producer as well, <laughs> helping them be vulnerable <laughs> and get the emotions out into their music, right? Talk aye, about aye. that. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> yes, that is exactly correct. Yeah. Uh, How do you do that? Uh, a lot of patience and listening. And um, um, 
you know, a certain amount of empathy and, and, and love for what you're doing and, and maybe love for that person or that, you know, whether you, yeah, you don't have to love them. You know what I mean? You know, you, 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 I'm not making all this up to sound all mushy and everything, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's, once you get a rapport with someone, you'd be in a room full of personalities. The, the trick there is to not like let the fight in the personality take you over. It's the trick is to find a way to get around the fight in the personality. Like we spoke about earlier on while ago conversations is get around the fight and, and let that person be neurotic. If you, ha if you have to, and let them be off and let them throw a mood and, drop the headphones and walk out for a minute and take a deep breath and come back and you're going, you okay? Let's talk about this. What's up? What's bothering you? I don't, I don't know that thing there. I, that's okay. All right, cool. Let's fix it. What do you think? What, what do you think it should be? What would you like to hear? What would you like to say? What would you like to, for people to think about you from what you're saying and singing? Well, I want people to think that I'm okay. Then let's try this. Really? Oh, that's a good idea. Boom. And then a smile comes on her face. And the next thing you know, everybody's happy. <laughs> so, I love it. That's great. It's, That's it's, fantastic. It's a not, it's, I actually dig that part of the job. I have to admit, when I first started doing this, um, I think I was trying to be tough. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'm the producer. Do it my way. You know, and yeah. I probably did that a few times. Uh, you know, and I know I did. And uh, uh, I'm sorry for whoever I did that to. No. <laughs> uh, they're long gone. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, and I learned after a while, I, I watched other producers just really not force it and find a way to let it happen. And, uh, I've had several mentors over the years. And so, um, it's, it's great. It's, it's good. It's great to see all that. Yeah. It's, it's great to be a part of it. Yeah. And, and, and once again, we go back to the reward and the reward is you pulled it off and that artist, that male or female singer or whatever loves what you did. And they, they go, thank you very much for what you did for me. Good, good, good. Right. My, you're yeah. welcome. My pleasure. Yeah. And, and you really served the music in the songs there by helping create that space to make it happen. Right. I so, hope so. I yeah. really hope so. I, very, I really, really hope that I pull that off. You know, um, that's, uh, so, you know, once again, you, you go to the issue of is, this, is it finished or not? Well, sometimes I wish I had more money. It could take longer you know, more budget money to take longer to try other things. But for the most part, after we have to go for the best kind of spontaneous thing that we can get. Cause man, I am not, you got to understand something here. If they're talking about recording, I am not going in and cutting tracks with a sequencer and throwing on a drummer, throwing on a bass player, then throwing on a guitar player. Then I'm not doing that. I'm filling the room up with musicians live microphones, headphones in the room, charts, no charts, notes, whatever know the song, what, learn the song, get it all together, count it off, and everybody plays it at the same time. Everybody's playing at the same time. Yeah, I, have, I always wow. have like the full rhythm section, you know. That's awesome. One or two guitars, bass, drums, and keyboards, sometimes two keyboards. Some, I've had sessions where I've had two guitar players and two keyboard players playing at the same time. I've had sessions where I've had a horn section with that much as well, Love you it. know, just keeping it all in line, you know, as much as you possibly can. You know, but I, I, I love that interplay of musicians, you know, uh, it's nothing like it. And, you know, some artists says, well, I've got my demos. They're really good. I'd like to keep my demos. Can you just put drums on them? And then out all these other things I go, I don't want to take your money. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather, you know, yeah. go ahead and do it that way if you want, but that's right. not the way to do it. Right. Yeah. Cause what, what you're doing is you're actually playing music, right? It's not computerized. Correct. It's not, right. uh, this is considered old school, sadly these it's days, totally, right? It's, it is totally old school. And I'm not saying it's just to, 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 uh, be revolt against the whole electronic thing, whatever it's, it's, it's in us. It's it. It's it. Half the stuff you hear on what we call radio music is going to have machines on it of some sort. And, and a lot of times it's just a programmer and an artist and the guy programs everything and the artist sings it. That, that doesn't feel very good to me. I don't, I, I hear that right away. And when I hear music, that's played by human beings. I hear that right away. And that rings true with me because what are we? We're, you know, a, a globe full of human beings that, you know, us, us musical lovers and we have culture. 
most important thing is the culture that we have of our music and where our music comes from in the United States. I, we can get onto a four hour rap if you want to get that, you know, sure. so I hold off on that, but, uh, uh, about where our music comes from. And I'm trying to, you know, I'm holding up on that. I'm OG, you know, you are the OG, Tony. That's great. <laughs> I love it. What, what haven't we talked about? There's been, there's a number of other artists that you are also working with that we uh, talked about before the, the interview, but please tell us about them and some of the, pro the other projects in addition to Taj Mahal you've got coming up. Uh, last year, I was, uh, we were nominated for a Grammy uh, on an artist by the name of Danielle Nicole. Uh, she's from Kansas City, and I produced uh, two records previous to that on her and her two brothers. And um, <clears throat> she went solo and signed a deal with Concord. And uh, I didn't get to make her first solo record, but I got to make her second one, and we got a Grammy nom last year. And that was a proud moment because uh, she is one of the most talented people I've ever worked with. She is an incredible singer. And, and that's saying singer. something. Oh, man. You've worked with a lot of people, Tony. Wow. Yeah. This, this, this woman, she stands up in front of the microphone knowing the song well in her head and her heart and holds onto the bass guitar left-handed and uh, plays the bass guitar on the track and sings the vocal at the same time. Wow. And most of it's a keeper. Wow. And I don't know too many people who get in there. So many people get the microphone scares them and the whatever, you know, and she doesn't, man, she lets loose and she really expresses herself. So that's, uh, you know, one of my more favorite things uh, and I'm quite proud of. I'm quite proud of several other records out there. Uh, the work that I did with Eric Burden, uh, three records with him and uh, three records that I co-produced with Curtis Salgado and Marlon McLean. They, they did well. I got, Blues Music Award nominations and the most two most Coco Montoya records that I've made and uh, the list is long. I've got you know I've produced thirty something records and um, so many that I'm proud of and everything over the years you know and um, um, it I just I just hope it keeps going. Yeah. You know? Well, man, congratulations on Thank all you. your success. It doesn't sound like it's slowing down, Tony. You're just getting nominated after nomination. So, no, yeah, the business is slowing things down. There are yeah. there are there are uh, things that we can't do anything about. That I wish yeah. they would have changed years and years ago about coding music and everything, so that ownership um, would be uh, traced a little easier, and and musicians and songwriters and producers. Yeah. would be getting paid more of their proper due for what's going on. But because yes. everybody thinks that the new way of this digital streaming situation is better for you. And then it gets out to more people and everything. It gets out to more people and more people get it for free. Right. And so it, it's, it's not perpetuating the music business. It's not putting money back into it. It's not taking care of the artists that make it. There's just not enough there. And everybody's looking for other ways to do it. And the artists that are established have to go on the road to make money. Whereas before, they would go on the road and they would make money from their recordings and you don't anymore. It's, it's a travesty. It's horrible. It's horrible. So yeah, like I said, I'm OG. I don't mind. I wear that. Right. Somebody can say, Oh, well, you're just old fashioned. I go, yes, I am. Thank you. Come along right. and join us. Come along and join us and learn to play your instrument and get in the studio with us. Okay. That's right. As opposed to programming what you're listening to. That's right. It's it definitely, it's, it's about music, not about computers yeah, or exactly. laptops or any of this stuff. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say the other artist that I recently did was, uh, I mentioned Nick Schneblin, whose record has been out. Yes. Getting a lot of good airplay and also Deb Ryder, an artist from around here in Los Angeles that I worked with and several other artists around here. Uh, uh, Laura Mitchell from Florida. It, you know, we did stuff that I think helped her career and, um, um, and I'm just going, I'm just backtracking. No big deal. I just wanted to make sure. Those no, it's, and well. you mentioned the Jimmy's as well, right? Yeah, the Jimmy's. Exactly. That's what I was trying to think of. I just finished their album and um, uh, it'll be out, I think, January 1, January 2. Oh, and uh, yeah. we spent a while making that and they were a hoot to work with. I went to uh, Milwaukee. They're from Madison, Wisconsin. I went to okay. Milwaukee for two, two different five or six day spells and we... Uh, made the album there with them and their guys. And it was quite cold. And, uh, you know, <laughs> definitely you in go, Milwaukee, when you go to, when you go to Milwaukee, you drink Wisconsin. -bly. 
I love it. That's got to be a state motto, right? I haven't heard no, that before. I, I felt like it's not original. I saw it on a t-shirt when I was leaving there. I was like, oh, man, <laughs> these guys party, you know? Right. And I saw the t-shirt in the, in, the, in the airport. And I went, Drake, Wisconsin. I went, okay, I get it. Right. <laughs> yeah, they've done that before, it sounds like. so. Yes, they did. Oh, uh, and and uh, any any fun gigs for yourself in addition to producing? Any drumming gigs coming up? Uh, well, I get to play locally with a band called the Bone Daddies, or a world beat band, and I've been playing with them since the '80s, late '80s, mid '80s, and uh, I love playing with those guys. It's a lot of African and uh, reggae and uh, all sorts of you know Caribbean uh, music or styles. Uh, I get to play with a local band called. Polly Sarah band. Uh, he's a saxophone player that plays with Bo Joe Bonamassa. And he's got probably 80, 90% original songs. And we do gigs around town. And I really look forward to it. It's a, it's a hard gig. I have to play three hours, three hours and 15 minutes solid without taking a break or anything. But but uh, I get I get through it. And wow, that is a long gig. That's a long gig, you know, with no break. You know, to, wow. You know. The only issue is possibly needing to go to the bathroom about halfway. Right, right I know, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Pee in no a cup, no. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no uh, intermission. And, and then I play with uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, Paul Brown, who's had a great career in smooth jazz. Um, he's, he's kind of branched off to doing stuff a little bit more rootsy, and he's got a project with his wife, Jackie Brown, and it's doing well, and he still makes smooth jazz records, and then he goes out and he, we do a, a rhythm and blues, a mixture of rhythm and blues and the smooth jazz, and I get to play those gigs, and they're That's a great. lot of fun, and That's great, great musicians. Every one of these situations yeah. has fantastic musicians on them, you know. Uh, a friend of mine, Car Carmen Grillo, is back up to doing gigs again. I'm playing with him, and you know, um, there's, a, there's a club nearby called the, the Right Off Room. It's in Woodland Hills, and <clears throat> it's owned by a musician, and he's doing a great job of making sure that a lot of great talent gets in there and uh, uh, you know, for an adult crowd, like my age group and which those types of places are disappearing or have gone and disappeared. And uh, so I get to do that around town and it's fun. I go out and do blues brothers dates. Occasionally I've got a couple coming up and um, what else am I doing? I'm going out with Phantom blues band to do some stuff and um uh, I'm at home a lot more than I was before, and I'm yeah. happier and, and healthier for doing it. And God, I miss my friends on the road. Uh, the thing I see on Facebook, they're all gonna, they're all somewhere in Paris, and it's beautiful, and they're playing some fabulous theater and somewhere, you know, in some historical part of Europe or whatever. And, and I go, oh, God, I wish I was there. But then that night, I'd have to get on a bus and I'd have to drive, you know, 800 miles to the next gig. Now I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wake up here and I go, I don't hear any bus. Okay. Right. Not smelling any diesel. Your, your, back, any diesel. your back isn't stiff from sleeping right. on a bus, right? Like, <laughs> right. But it, it, you're not getting this on the hotel door. Checkout time, you know, right. housekeeping. Right. <laughs> right. But man, you're, it sounds like you're producing up a storm and having fun still playing. Tony, let, let's sort of wrap with uh, – yeah. You know, we were talking about music and mental health. I think you've shared some great stuff, whether it's doing some yoga, some hypnotherapy, uh, letting go of the ego. What advice would you give uh, an up-and-coming younger musician, whatever instrument, about how to take care of themselves, music and mental health-wise, whether on the road or looking to get where you are producing? What advice would you give? To be philosophical, uh once you understand what music does to you when you learn how to play it, it does to your body and your mind and your heart because you see what it does to other people. That reaction, part of that reaction is yours. Own it, respect it, and do it the best you can every time and never phone it in. And always, when you're on stage playing, realize that you have the power to to get this across to these people, to entertain, to move them with a beat, the rhythm, whatever. It's, there's a manipulation in that. And keep that sort of good psychological uh, outlook of, of realizing that you're serving something special. You got given a gift to be able to play. Realize the gift and, and, and take care of it. 
Awesome. Awesome stuff. Tony Braunagel, thank you so much for being on the Rock Therapy Show. It's always a treat to talk with you, Tony. You too, man. Thank you very much. It was a great time. Lots of fun. I'm sure I'll hear from you in the next few days.